organization decided to address the HIV and the poverty together so that we might make an effect in the continu continuum of care. So I'm going to talk to you about a new model that we're utilizing right now in conjunction with the Baltimore City Health Department, Johns Hopkins, uh, the University of Maryland Jocks Initiative that's coming out of the faith community. See, typically, our response to our HIV-positive brothers and sisters um, is somewhat different in the faith community than it is, or in any community, than it is outside. If we individually were facing an issue. For example, if I were in danger of poverty, if I had HIV and I was in danger of poverty, or if I was in poverty, right? I might not be surrounded by a network of people with assets, with jobs, with, and the list could go on. But if I was in danger of poverty, I have my faith community around me. I have the people that I work with. I have these social networks. Sometimes within the context of the faith community, though, we don't think about the church as being this social network, right? And our solution for the poor has been to donate our secondhand goods, like our used blue jeans, and our cans of SpaghettiOs in our pantry that are about to spot, uh, expire. And then we pat ourselves on the back and we say, look at the service that we did for God. And it's unfortunate. Because we forget the assets that we have, the human resource capacity that we have within the faith community. So the issue is we've lacked a model, okay? Transactions, they require stuff, right? But transformation requires a model. And we in the business world are used to utilizing models all the time. So we've started working with an organization because we work through partnerships, so please do hear me out. In all that we do at Hope Springs, we work to build capacity within partnerships. So in our partnership with the Baltimore City Health Department, we said, what if we took somebody else's poverty model, added HIV components into it, and addressed the poverty and the HIV at the same time? And this is what we have. It's called a table. A team of 10 to 12 individuals around one person who's positive and living in poverty, working to address the poverty-related issues. Each person that sits around the table, around the brother or sister, we don't have clients. We have brothers and sisters. No one wants to be treated as a client. They want to be treated as a friend. We have table members, just as we would sit right around here, around this table right now, and each generalist fills a role. A role in finance. Are you good with your home budget? Sure, you can be the finance chair. You can coordinate that work. Have you been to school? Do you know how to do a FAFSA? Sure, you can coordinate the education work. Have you worked through healthcare related issues? Sure, you can fill that healthcare uh, chair. And we work in this way. We work to build a life plan and meet with a brother or sister on a weekly basis throughout the course of the year. The brother or sister sets the priorities for the table and we work as a team in mutuality in order to respond and work with them on their needs. You might be thinking, okay, this sounds great, but what does this look like? Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my brother on the table that I'm on. Um, his name is uh, Anthony. He said I was allowed to share his name. Anthony makes $10,000 a year. He's a hairdresser. Um, he came out of the foster care system because he was a twin and he was gay. And he got kicked out of his family and out of his church community. And this is something that we see, unfortunately, far too frequently. So Anthony bump, jumps around in the foster care system, becomes a hairdresser. Makes ten thousand dollars a year, but if you ask him what he wants to do, he'll tell you it's to be a social worker. So, in our life plan, he's saying, "Aaron, I want to be a social worker." You know, he's saying our whole, to our whole table, and we said, "Okay." It just so happens that we actually had a social worker on our table, somebody from our church who worked at the University of Maryland. Well, obviously, he's going to need to go back to school. He said, "Well, I tried that, but I can't go back to school because I can't afford it." Well, brother, have you thought about a Pell Grant? Well, Pell Grants, receiving Pell Grants, which are grants for low-income individuals, are tied to taxes, to the FAFSA system. And because he makes $10,000 a year, he thought, I don't need to provide my taxes. You see, all of these issues are tied together. But if you ask one person, including myself, to try to tie all of these issues in one place and work through them all, essentially what you're asking me to do is to go from organization to organization to organization to organization to organization, to organization 
to city building, to city building, to city building, to city building. But as a team of volunteers from the faith community utilizing our assets and resources from within that faith community, we were able to network for a tax attorney for $1 who would do his taxes. Our gentleman in our finance chair went through a finance course at our church and is training our brother on finances. Our brother gets back into school. He's in a math class. He starts struggling. It just so happens that one of the individuals on our table's wife is a math teacher. He sits, he does his um, math tutoring with her, right? All of these resources that we all have, these are generalists, these are not specialists in this area. We network, we network for our specialists. So as we walk through addressing these full life issues from the context of the faith community, our brother, is able to look at his HIV care differently because we're bringing clients to him, he's a hairdresser, right? By utilizing our social networks. So his income is increasing while he's working on his degree at the same time, we're helping him with paperwork filling things out and it becomes a different type of network. At the end of the day, what it is, is a group of friends for somebody who has lived in isolation and rejection because of a status. He is not defined by his HIV, but for many of our brothers and sisters, they feel defined everywhere they go by a virus, by a virus. So we are working to address, not only build capacity through working in HIV service providers like Movable Feast and errors and all of these different ones, but we're also looking to address some of the root causes utilizing the faith community. And here's the key. Every 100 members in a faith community have 5,000 community connections. They have jobs. They have access to resources that we might not have. They have a network, friends, hobbies, civic groups, etc. And so it's thinking about the context of the faith community and utilizing the faith community, the assets for what it is, engaging them in the right way and getting them out of the church, out of the four walls. Can I ask just how your model works? Your table model is each table member touching base with the brother yep. each week? Yep, and then we you all meet, meet as a table meet together. every single week for a year. Okay. Is this something your organization does or you help churches we your we do it but we do it through the church so we train the church okay. on how to do this and when provide technical assistance and walk alongside them do okay. the church recruiting because we're already in churches anyway right. so this is just something new that we're doing within the context of our churches um, this table model itself has an amazing return of investment over volunteer hours goods and services etc alone um, uh, each table uh, puts in about forty to forty-five thousand dollars. It's really quite amazing. And um, the City of Phoenix Human Resources Department said that for every dollar the government invested, actually tables benefit. Um, the table benefits seven dollars and forty-four cents. It's utilizing the, what we're already doing. You know, the interesting thing is Baltimore is a city of firsts. Um, you know, there are ninety-six firsts in Baltimore. First woman in a medical institution. First light rail system. For, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It's quite amazing. We're actually the first to take this HIV model in the nation and utilize it for poverty. And we're doing it. We're doing it in conjunction with the leaders out here. We're doing it with the health department. We're doing it with the Jacques Initiative. The Jacques Initiative is at the Institute of Human Virology. It's where they discovered that HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. We're doing it with Hopkins, world-renowned people. And we're utilizing the church. I mean, it's these are resources that are out there and that are at our fingertips. Um, so we've launched these new tables. We're actually, as an organization, working within uh, the context of about 70 different faith communities for Baltimore, um, all throughout the region. Um, we have uh, volunteers serving um, about 20,000 hours. We are saving our partners a ton of money. Um, and we have people doing anything from financial literacy training to meal delivery to this table model, et cetera, by utilizing what's already happening within the context of the church. So we're a really small organization. It's myself and two part-timers. We've uh, about 400 plus, train, almost close to 500 now trained volunteers, but we have touched over 10,000 people in a year alone with HIV education utilizing the church. 
5,000 people testing over the context of the last six years utilizing the church. Um, our model has been featured in a film called The Gospel of Healing, Black Churches Respond to HIV and AIDS. Um, I'm on the HIV uh, Commission for the City of Baltimore. I'm also the chair of the Johns Hopkins Center for Research Community Advisory Board. And, and it, to me, it's just an amazing thing because when you think about it, I'm not an HIV expert. Yeah, I've worked in the field of HIV since 1999, but all from the context of the church. So it's an exciting place to be in. Our model was also recently utilized to birth another organization just like ours that works with human trafficking. It's replicable, it's awakening, it's equipping the church, and then it's engaging church out there. Out there in the community that's already doing things. So you define your um, service area as Baltimore City itself, and you don't go into the county. So we are in the county as well. County, Baltimore yep. City. Yep, Baltimore City and County. As a matter of fact, um, we're working now with the church in Washington, D.C. and an HIV clinic in D.C. as well. We are slowly but surely expanded. We are funded solely by individuals and churches, with the exception of the stable model, which the health department is giving us some time in order to do. Do you deal with the um, hierarchy of the churches? In other words, going to the bishops, so if, instead of going to 1,800 churches, you would go to so, the Episcopal there are times when we work within the context of the hierarchy, but there are also times when the hierarchy is not open, but the pastors are. So we have to navigate that. We have to navigate the fact that last weekend I was in a, an Episcopal church, the Sunday before I was in a PCUSA church in the morning and a PCA church in the evening, and we balance from denomination to de denomination. We are able to, to stay that way. We are able to work with churches on both the liberal and the conservative network because we say this. We are called by God to love people where they are, as they are, and to engage in relationship. You look throughout the Christian Bible, you look throughout the Torah, you find that God is a God of relationships. And when you start looking at that and speaking in terms of those terms, it opens up the conversation. In our trainings though, our first section of our training that we offer, it's called the journey. We have to spend time talking to the church in church language about things like the fact that there is this dichotomy in the church. You have your evangelical churches and then you have your social gospel churches. And churches put themselves in those two rings. The fact is we're actually called to do all. But we can't say, oh, we're just in it for your soul, or we're just in it to serve. You know, it's creating this, this it's looking at a person as their uh, spiritual, social, emotional, mental needs. Not just a person as their spiritual being over here and their physical being over there. That's where the church gets it rough. Right? So I, I threw this picture up here because a gentleman in poverty who is HIV positive, we have he was asked to draw what it would look like for him, excuse me, for him to come out of poverty, and this is what he drew. I have to go here, and then I have to go there, I have to go there, I have to go there. Do you work with the, uh, outside of the Christian based or the Abraham based model? Do you work with mosques? Do you work with Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, we have invited mosques to many things that we have done, but we've not ever had um, any great connection in there, and we are totally 100% open to it, and we would love to. Um, this is, I, I'm telling you in general, HIV in the context of the faith community is a really difficult area to engage in because of two reasons. Number one, you have to talk about how the faith community interacts with the LGBTQ community. And right off the bat, some churches are saying we're not doing that. Right? Number two, you have to talk about sex. The churches don't like to talk about sex. So. For some people, right off the bat, this is a very intimidating issue. So if we can talk about it from the context of, oh, your church is already doing, say, blood pressure screenings, what would it look like if you added HIV education into that or HIV testing? Or, oh, I see that you guys are serving um, in a transportation ministry. What would it look like of serving our HIV positive brothers and sisters in that way? We have to think about what is the church already doing and how can we Think about adding HIV into those places as well. Um, but uh, so for all of our volunteers that come through on things other than one day events, we require everybody to go through our training first so that we really can build capacity within our providers. So it's a different model for sure. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, I, I 
I guess I, I want to leave you with this. One of our partners always says this. He says, we're not called to do everything, but we are called to do something. And within the context of the church, my question always is, what is your something? Because you have been created for a something. You have been created for a something. So, um, anyway. Karen, thank you very thank much. You very much. Yeah, thank you. I just had a, a, a practical kind of question because I heard you talking about people working uh, low wage jobs and then having to take out time to go for treatments. Are there not night treatment clinics that seem to be? No, as a matter of fact, to... the majority of clinics in the city of Baltimore, the big clinics, are open your standard eight to five or nine to five. I mean, you think about it, for our brothers and sisters living in poverty, regardless of whether or not they have HIV, we function on an eight to five system, typically, which is not conducive for our low income workers who cannot take off time in the middle of the day or may not have the flexibility in the middle of the day to address the needs that they need to without it taking a hit on certain areas of their lives. You know, it's a system, unfortunately, of poverty maintenance, I think. And I think it's something we don't talk about. You know, Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, you guys had an awesome, over the summer, I'm sorry, I'm an NPR listener, if you can tell. So you had an awesome series on Lyndon B. Johnson, The War on Poverty, right? 50 year anniversary, $13.6 trillion, right? And the poverty rate has not changed. In this field of HIV, all of the billions of dollars that we've put into research, the HIV infection rate has not changed over the last almost 10 years. It's because we, we don't set up our systems to think about the whole person and what they face. We say we're gonna treat one piece of it, one piece of it, one piece of it, one piece of it. So that at the end of the day, you have somebody saying, this is what it's gonna take for me. And it just gives us something to think about. It gives us something to think about when we look and we go through our Starbucks line and we grab something to drink and, and we say, okay, I, I just don't want to tip, right? It gives us something to think about because we don't necessarily see the stories on the back end of that. Aaron, this has been very, uh, very thoughtful and very helpful to us and we really do appreciate you. Uh, well, thank Sorry you. we don't have more time. To That's okay. Do. Thank you so much so, for your time thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate be, it. Uh, Welcome to stay in. Okay. Master Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I just left another meeting, too. Um, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Curtis Watkins Quick, uh, born and raised in New Jersey. I came to Baltimore to work with a, my instructor and build community relationships with the children to find out what's going on in the community. Um, I'm a martial arts specialist. And what that means is not only we do kicking and punching and karate tournaments and stuff like that, we work with the kids that's been into bullying, being bullied, uh, rape prevention for women, even men, uh, domestic violence. That is the key to our company, well, the company that I run, uh, working with youth. Uh, what I see today is, in the, I work at a school, in the elementary school, too, with the behavior that's going on in the school system. Uh, teachers can't get the kids to engage in work or to focus on doing homework or things that are going on at home. Uh, I was brought in to work with the behavior, with the martial arts background, how do we get these kids to focus more and be disciplined and respect the teacher? Because uh, I tell you, it's, it's, it's tough. These teachers have a tough job. Whoever is teaching it, I, I, they should get paid more than what they're getting paid. I, I just sit back and see the things that they go through. And so what I do, I come into the classrooms or they come to my class and we sit down and talk. 
I go down to their level, I bring them back up to my level. Teach them right from wrong. I know that sometimes they don't get the discipline at home. Uh, there could be no father in the home, or the mother's on drugs. It could be anything, but these kids are losing focus. They could be in ADHD. Um, I work with all kids. I work in the county, and I work in the city. Uh, what I see is that sometimes they just want attention. And sometimes they need a hug or, or love. Um, recently, say recently, uh, Monday, uh, we had a kid that really didn't connect with the school. Like he was new at the school and he didn't really want to be bothered. And we watched his IEP. He was very violent in other schools. So I sat down with him and learned about what's going on in your background? What is it that you want to become or want to be growing up? And for him to be so violent and, and angry, he said he wanted to be a police officer. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, you could be that. So we have to change your attitude about the world or about yourself. Because they have no self-respect for themselves. So once they get out into the community, we have issues because they can't focus. So what they see out there in their neighborhood is, I want to be like this guy, he on the corner, or he has money, or he does this. And I said, there's a better way. I said, take me for example. I grew up in the urban city. I grew up on the mean streets of Newark, New Jersey. I said, I seen it all, but I had to change my life because I seen people life been taken, and I knew I wanted other things to do. So that's when I created my martial arts program at the age of 18. And from 18 till 